as a result of American efficiency, he is going to get a chance. So our final speaker for the day, Ben Denniston, come on up. 21st Century Science and Technology. <laughs> All right, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I will try and match that level of efficiency. Um, so, I mean, we've gone through a lot. I want to just, just try and take a few minutes to step back and look at everything we've discussed on the New Silk Road, the expansion of the New Silk Road to the World Land Bridge, and re-examine a lot of these details, the aspects of this from a broader perspective of Mr. LaRouche's work on the science of physical economics. And I think Jason already covered a lot of the basis of this. So I'll just refer to what he said at the beginning, where, you know, by Mr. LaRouche's scientific discoveries, we know that economics is not just about money. It's not just about market analysis. It's not about goods production per se. You really are looking at the science of how mankind progresses in a completely unique way. And Mr. LaRouche often refers to the, the distinction of mankind and the animal species as a useful reference point to illustrate what makes mankind unique. As has been said, any animal species is, has a fixed relation to its environment, has a fixed ecological characteristic. Humankind does not. Humankind is characterized in its most fundamental essence by the ability to continually revolutionize our relation to the environment. And I think this perspective provides a new way to look at the new Silk Road, the World Land Bridge, as the role it plays in a certain process of human development. And this can maybe be got at initially by this image, I think Jason had the same one, of the earth at night. Hopefully that's visible to our audience here. Um, but I think what you see uh, immediately is that much of the economic activity, human development, is still along the coastal regions. There's been various estimates. I saw some figures that something like about 40% of the world population is still believed to be living within 60 miles of the coast. And you can have various ways of measuring that coastal area, but by a very generous estimate, that could be maybe be about 10% of the continental land mass. So almost half the world population living in less than 10% of the continental area. It's an interesting perspective. As we see, this is maybe not the most, this is a depiction of the six land routes and the one maritime component of the Belt and Road Initiative. I apologize if this map isn't completely accurate, but this is one indication of the six different routes. And as we see immediately, you know, these are routes going through many of these inland territories, going through many of these landlocked regions, inland regions, and obviously very similar with the, what Hal just took us through some of the exciting components of the expansion of this into a global world land bridge perspective. And again, we see these main routes, these main corridors traversing many of these inland regions. Um, as Helga and Lyndon LaRouche have envisioned this global project, the, the intention is to do much more than simply connect existing population centers, but to bring new levels of development, economic development, population, activity throughout these inland territories. Uh, in effect, enable these inland regions, these landlocked regions to become as productive or even more productive than the coastal regions have been historically. And I think to appreciate the principle behind this, what this really signifies, uh, we really have to go back and look take a clear, hard look at Mr. LaRouche's work in the science of economics, and in particular, uh, a better understanding of what economic infrastructure really means. 
as Jason discussed, the idea of creating a synthetic environment which sustains and supports the existence of a new level of human civilization. And mankind continually going through successive developments of higher order synthetic platforms. So I just have one quote from Mr. LaRouche I want to read from a 2010 paper entitled, What Your Accountant Never Understood, The Secret Economy. And in there he stated, we should then recognize that the development of basic economic infrastructure had always been the needed creation of what is required as a habitable development of a synthetic rather than a presumably natural environment for the enhancement or even the possibility of human life and practice at some point in the existence of our human species. Man as a creator in the likeness of the great creator uh, is expressed by humanity's creation of the artificial environments we sometimes call infrastructure on which both the progress and even the mere continued existence of civilized society depends. And this was part of a kind of an initiative Mr. LaRouche launched to upgrade people's understanding of what infrastructure really means for mankind. And based on this thesis, he developed a rather fascinating succession of what he called economic platforms. I'm going to go through this rather quickly, but you know, there could be room for more discussion later. But he said you want to go all the way back to ancient, even prehistoric, transoceanic maritime civilizations even going back as far before the uh, last, the interglacial melt to the last glacial period, going back a couple of tens of thousands of years. And you look at a civilization that existed largely on certain coastal regions, maybe certain river systems. It was largely uh, related to sea routes and sea travel. And it was actually based upon the scientific understanding of the sky and the star map that gave this early, relatively advanced civilization this new level of existence. And then he defined the next major revolution being the development of canal systems, the management of river systems, and the creation of interlinked inland waterways as the beginning of mankind beginning to create a new synthetic environment allowing mankind to move civilization further into the inland territories. And I believe many different civilizations have their own history of this, their own particular historical process of this type of activity, but for European civilization, Mr. LaRouche highlighted the work of Charlemagne in particular as really launching this beginning of this uh, inland waterway system throughout Europe. The next major revolution was basic rail systems. And here, the United States really pioneered the effort with the efforts of President John Quincy Adams up through Abraham Lincoln and the Trans Transcontinental Railroad connecting the coastal regions and connecting many inland regions with this new technology of rail systems. Um, really, in effect, creating as if you're creating artificial rivers of iron, steel, goods, and people now bringing pe population and civilization deeper into inland regions in ways not possible before. And then in this historical process, Mr. LaRouche has situated uh, what he defines as a qualitative distinction above just basic rail when you start talking about high-speed rail, electrified high-speed rail, magnetic levitation systems especially, you're vastly increasing the speed, you have the capability for higher capacity, you have the transportation basis to really have mankind with these types of synthetic environments conquer the interior regions of entire continental land masses in a way not possible before. And create the conditions, and you know, as has been discussed, this is not just rail. Rail is a huge part, uh, transportation is a huge part, but power generation, um, nuclear power is going to be a must if we're going to bring the global power uh, uh, 
use up to a level sufficient for mankind's standards and requirements. Um, water development, everything from China's South Water North project, which is an impressive, amazing project, to the renewed interest in the Trans Aqua in Africa to bring water from the tributaries of the Congo into refilling Lake Chad. You know, you're talking about continental scale management of water systems, along with things like desalination, weather control. So by Mr. LaRouche's conception, this whole world land bridge is bringing, you know, and along with the associated healthcare, education, cultural development as well, you're bringing all the conditions needed for advanced higher levels of human life into the inland territories in a fully developed way. So from the standpoint of Mr. LaRouche's work, the new Silk Road, the World Land Bridge is not simply infrastructure as the way people tend to think about infrastructure today. This is really the next stage, the next historical stage in the natural development of mankind as a creative, a uniquely creative force, as the expression of mankind as a creator, as Mr. LaRouche said in that quote. You know, returning to this pedagogical distinction of mankind versus animals, you know, each one of these platform shifts, shifts is like an evolutionary transformation of the ecological characteristics of the human species. Except for obviously this didn't come with biological changes or physiological changes. This was driven by scientific discovery, cultural development, the unique characteristics of what makes mankind mankind. And it is this type of revolutionary advance that is the most distinguishing characteristic of human nature. So I think one of the most important points that we want to focus on as part of this whole process is that it's not any one stage of human development that defines mankind. It's not a particular level of culture. It's not a particular level of technology. It's not a particular level of science. It's not any particular infrastructure platform. It's the, it's the ability to always transcend to successively higher, qualitatively higher levels of existence. We see the world land bridge as a part of that step, kind of completing the ability of mankind to develop the continental regions as a whole. But we see this as just another step in an ongoing process. And I think it's pretty clear that the next steps beyond this are going into space and developing a real platform of human economic activity in the earth moon system. And going beyond just visiting locations, exploring locations in space, but actually beginning real human economic development of the solar system, starting with the moon, looking towards Mars, and developing the kinds of infrastructure and technologies that can support this and make space travel as accessible, as regular, as what we now think of as common everyday activities. So things like fusion propulsion, you're taking the travel time to Mars from something like six or eight months down to a couple weeks, maybe a couple days, right? Things like advanced technologies for access to space, uh, space planes that can take off from a runway and take you into orbit, bypassing all the needs of rocket systems, space planes you could use over and over again or things like vacuum tube maglev launch into space could drop the cost of putting tonnage into orbit 500 fold. It costs one 500th the cost of current expense. And the development of resources on other planetary bodies, getting beyond the need to take everything with us for exploration. Things like mining helium-3 on the moon, which is probably the best fusion fuel known to man at this point, developing basic bases and infrastructure on the moon and other planetary bodies. So these define you know, some broad categories that I think should, coming out of what we're discussing with the Silk Road, we should also be thinking about the future next steps where we can transform 
mankind's relation to space in the same way we've transformed mankind's relation to the interior regions of continents, to other regions of planet Earth, and recognize that it's only this process of continual successive development where every generation is engaged in new revolutionary challenges that we can really be adequately satisfied with our uh, human existence. So I'll try and keep succession, uh, keep things succinct here, and I'll leave it there. <laughs>